Okay. Good morning and thank you for joining us. We'll get started momentarily. If you would like to leave a question for one of our panelists, be sure to enter your question into the Q&A &A, um, opportunity in Zoom. There is a question and answer button that you can click and add your question if you have any questions for our panelists. We'll get started momentarily.
Hi there and welcome. Um, I want to just welcome everybody today. As we still have people joining, I would like to let you know that if you have a question for any of our panelists, you can use the Q&A function, which are the little balloons down on the, on the bottom, to ask a question for any of our panelists today. I know that we have a very packed um, session today, so I want to go ahead and get started, even though we have people still joining us. My name is Margie Levin, and I'm the ADL Southwest Assistant Regional Director. And it, like I said, I want to thank you for joining us today um, on this wet and rainy day, but hopefully everybody is safe. As many of you may know, and for those of you who don't, ADL was founded in 1913 in response to an escalating climate of anti-Semitism and bigotry. Our founders started ADL initially to fight anti-Semitism but they quickly realized that they couldn't fight just one type of hate without fighting all types of hate. Working with allies is a big part of our mission. So our mission statement is to stop the defamation of Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. Today, ADL continues to fight all forms of hate and, de and dedication with dedication, vigor, and passion. We are a nonpartisan 501c3 organization. Today, our panelists know firsthand how hate hurts, and they're going to share their stories as well as talk about the history of hate and how being an ally of hate helps to dole its sting and prevent it from happening again. At this time, I want to turn it over to our moderator and ADL Southwest Regional Director, Mark Tobin. Mark. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Margie, and thanks so much for organizing uh, today's webinar. I'm very pleased to be with you all, and thank you all for joining us, and hope everybody is safe and dry from uh, Tropical Storm Beta. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our terrific panel of speakers today. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Mark Goldberg is a director of Jewish studies and an associate professor of history at the University of Houston. He's also an affiliate for University of Houston Center for Mexican American Studies and the Center for Public History. He teaches courses in Latinx history, Jewish studies, and the history of race and ethnicity. Uh, he also has a book coming out on the history of Jewish Latinx community. Uh, Dr. Goldberg welcomed uh, today's webinar. Also, Sarah Hader is the assistant director for chapter management of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. Uh, she is a community activist uh, who has both traveled a long way uh, from her native country, but also from her original uh, occupation, which was a uh, civil engineer. She has an MBA in civil engineering, uh, but her life's passion and her life's work uh, is dedicated to engineering a cure for hate. Uh, she's uh, assistant director for chapter management uh, and she's the founding Muslim co-lead for the Sisterhood for Sh Salam Shalom uh, Houston chapter. Uh, Sarah, thank you for being here today as well. Uh, next, Desmond Bertrand Pence is the Center for African American History's CEO. Many of y'all may know this better as the Buffalo Soldiers National Museum. Uh, it is a passion project of his grandfather, which has been turned into a national institution. Uh, Desmond currently oversees all operations, programming, and finances. Um, he's also highly engaged in Houston's community, having served uh, as a member of the mayor's Houston Diversity Council and is an active member of many uh, other community organizations. Desmond, uh, really appreciate you being here today as well. H.C. Uh, Chang is president of the Organization of Chinese Americans, Greater Houston. H.C. Uh, is an attorney who practices civil litigation. Uh, he's licensed to practice in Texas and New Mexico and has almost 20 years of legal experience uh, under his belt. Uh, HC, really appreciate you being here. Uh, so let's, let's get started. Uh, Dr. Goldberg, uh, first, wanna, uh, first certainly thank you for being here, uh, but wanna begin the question you know, with you. Uh, as a Latino Jew, uh, have you experienced um, bias yourself? Have you been a target of bias? And, and if so, uh, did you have any allies 
that you found were helpful in confronting that bias? Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, and I'll start by answering the question a little bit about my Latinoness. You know, I, my Latino, I'm Mexican American. Uh, it's racially unmarked, so um, I am white. I am U.S. born. Uh, so the form of bias I've experienced, the, the example I'm going to give has to do with anti-Jewish bias. Um, I've generally been free of anti-Latinx bias. Uh, but I will give an example that happened to me recently uh, as a Jew, and this actually happened at work in class. It was a Jewish studies course, and it, it had to do with something a student wrote in an essay. And before the essay assignment even arose, part of the story involves the fact that the student had an issue with me. He felt that I wronged him. Um, and that made its way into the essay, uh, which included an anti-Semitic remark, which was somewhat subtle and coded, and it, it, it worked along the lines of, you know, the stereotype of Jews as, as conniving or two-faced. Um, but within the context of what had been going on between the student and myself, it, it was apparently um, an anti-Semitic remark in my mind. And I did have an ally uh, in the moment. And, and I, I would say my biggest ally in the moment was the chair of my department um, as we dealt with the issue. And I do also want to point out that the chair of my department um, was a black man. And the reason why I'm raising that is because it actually reflects the history that I'm going to talk about later, histories of allyship and and solidarity. So, so, so yes, to, to round out my answer, um, I have been a, a target of bias and I did have an ally who helped me navigate the situation. And, and that must have been particularly challenging given the relationship between teacher and student as well and, and trying to, to navigate that aspect of it, no, no doubt. Uh, you mentioned the history and uh, before uh, I ask uh, the other panels to talk about their experiences. Could you really sort of address, you know, from your perspective as a as a historian, um, the you know the importance of allies coming together to fight prejudice and hate, and and examples uh, that that you can provide about the effectiveness of that kind of relationship. Yeah, so there is a history in the United States of allyship, and it's, a, it's an important history, of course. And there are a lot of examples we can draw from. I think the most well-known might be during the African-American Civil Rights Movement, um, which did receive multiracial support. Um, also, the Chicano Movement, the same, and um, coming out of the Chicano Movement or part of it, the United Farm Workers Movement, um, was a, a, co a multiracial coalition of workers. So, so there are many examples to draw from and all the ones I named actually really kind of center on social movements. So I do want to give one, I guess, talk about one example more in depth. Um, that might be lesser known and it does not only involve moments when there is a social movement, although, we, although that probably does describe the moment we're in, but it does, I think, um, I think looking at not just, again, these national movements uh, for histories of alliance or allyship are important. So, so the moment I want to talk about actually was in the 1950s uh, around what was termed by the US government as Operation Wetback, specifically the Los Angeles version, which was known as Operation Roundup. So a little bit of a brief history of Operation Wetback. Um, it was it was a, a, f a federally led national um, deportation campaign, anti-Mexican deportation campaign, predominantly anti-Mexican. Um, it was a response to increases in immigration, both documented and undocumented, in the 1940s. And following another Mexican repatriation campaign in the 1930s, the 1950s Operation Wetback. Um, also saw both Mexicans and Mexican Americans being deported. So I think it is just important to state outright that there were US citizens that were deported as part of 
Operation Wetback, which highlights the ways in which Mexicans in general are racialized as, as foreigners. Um, so in Los Angeles, like I was saying, it was no the movement or the movement, sorry, the campaign was known as Operation Roundup. And there was multiracial activism against the campaign uh, in, in two major ways. So first of all, there were multiracial organizations in LA, like the Los Angeles Committee for the Protection of the Foreign Born, which protected individuals from deportation. So it worked at the individual level. And then there was, um, there was there were a series of protests against deportation that saw various groups come together, including Jewish Americans, Japanese Americans, and African Americans. And what's important about this story uh, is that these allies were reading what was going on through their own experiences. So Jewish Americans being less really the, a decade removed from the Holocaust, Japanese and Japanese Americans thinking about Japanese internment, uh, World War II Japanese internment during this deportation campaign, and African Americans reading, reading this moment through the lens of anti-Black police brutality. And so I want to actually give you a quote. I, I wrote down a quote uh, by an African American man who went unnamed. It's, it, he's quoted in a newspaper, so, so we unfortunately don't have his name. But what he said was, quote, I know many of those people have been here for a long time, talking about Mexicans being deported, some of them all their adult lives. Those are people who worked hard and helped to build this country. How can they call those Mexican people foreigners? This country was originally theirs. I wonder if those immigration cops realize how it makes us, us being African Americans, feel when they start kicking the Mexicans around. So again, I think what's important- That's right, and that was published recently or that was published? That came out, right. That came out of um, a newspaper in the moment, in the 1950s. Right, but no, I, think, I, no but, I know, but it, it, could right. have been, it could have been published, you know. Exactly, recently. right, but, your point stands true where we're seeing a similar, a similar moment and, a, and similar responses. And all of them were reading Mexican deportation and anti-Mexican racism through their own experiences with hate. And so this and other similar moments are important when thinking about allyship. And, and you know, one of the reasons why, one of the main reasons why is because they show these responses or this, this, uh, this example of allyship shows that that individuals on the ground saw these struggles as connected, which they are. All of the various lenses that the individuals read Operation Roundup through um, hinged on white supremacy, were responses to white supremacy or moments of white supremacy. And so, not all, so the, again, these, these group responses to uh, Mexican deportation shows not just allyship, but also that the struggles are connected. And, and I think that's an important lesson from this history. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the questions that we were talking about be, before we started, I guess, in our virtual green room, um, and, and this is for something I think for, for all the panels to, to think about as, as we're answering, which is, you know, what is the difference between an ally and an advocate um, as, as we talk about these experiences? And, and, you know, Sarah, maybe you want to start, but, uh, you know, HC and Desmond, please chime in. What have y'all's experiences been in confronting bias? You know, particularly, I know, Desmond, you know, your museum just recently experienced some issues. But Sarah, if you'd like to, to please, you know, start and, and tell us of, of your experiences and, and perhaps how allies have, have helped you confront these issues. Sure. So in my mind, first of all, um, there are several degrees of connection and support between communities. So an ally is somebody who stands with you in principle versus an advocate is someone who is more proactive in taking action to support uh, marginalized communities voice. 
So in that context, um, I go back to the Islamic framing of um, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, saying that when you encounter injustice, stop it with your hand. If that is something you find difficult, stop it with your tongue. If you can't even do that, stop it. At least know in your heart that that's the wrong thing to do. So the highest level of um, responding to any injustice against anyone is to stop it with your actions. And that to me defines an ally is somebody who believes in their heart and uses their tongue to support another voice. However, an advocate is someone who is more proactive in taking action to prevent hate from happening. Yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, a, a very insightful uh, distinction. And, and what, what experiences have you had to, to encounter in terms of your own confrontation with, with prejudice and bias? So there's definitely a lot of uh, unfortunately circumstances where we, uh, the Muslim community has been the target of hate and bias in the US. And I think the first experience I personally had was in 1995 when the Oklahoma City bombing took place. I was working in Birmingham, Alabama at the time and I went home for lunch. And when I came back, I felt like all eyes were on me as if I had done something wrong. I didn't even know what happened. And in that time, the bombing had happened in Oklahoma and everybody had jumped to the conclusion that it was a Muslim person who attacked the building. And everyone knew that I had stayed in Birmingham. I came within the hour. There's no way I could have gone and bombed the building in Oklahoma. But I felt all of that questioning my presence in my own, um, my own work environment. And that was very, very uncomfortable. It was within uh, a month of me starting my first job out of grad school. And in Birmingham, Alabama, where I didn't know anybody other than the people I work with, it was a very, very uncomfortable situation. No doubt, yeah. So another thing that happened more recently, um, since I've been involved in the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom in 2016 and onwards, in, I wanna say about two years ago, we were, ironically, that was a um, Sisterhood presentation at the Islamic Society of North America Conference in Houston. And we were at the Georgia Brown um, Convention Center and my children were with me in that session. So while I was speaking about building bridges with the Jewish community through the sisterhood, my younger daughter looked visibly distressed while she was on her phone. And, um, you know, I was concerned, but I was also thinking that, okay, maybe she's reacting to somebody who said something and it's not that big a deal. But when I realized that this was more than just a passing comment, I stepped away from presenting and I turned it over to another colleague to continue our presentation. And I came around to see her and she told me that she was cyberbullied. She was new in the school district. She was a sixth grader who was just going into a new school and felt targeted and very, very insecure because they basically had a very hateful message for her. Whoever did that, they created a hater profile and were saying nasty things to her. And the way my daughter and I felt surrounded with love and support in that environment with our sisterhood members, just rallying around our family and supporting us and helping restore her confidence that she had done nothing wrong for somebody to target her and that she had a voice and she needed to know that she was valued and loved and she belonged. So that was a very personal uh, reaction. You know, experiencing it for yourself is one thing, but sure. when your child is targeted, it's Absolutely. a very different scenario. Right, right. Um, and and I, I, I imagine, you know, just the, the strength that, that the, the sisters were able to provide her had to be immensely helpful just to her competence uh, and to her ability to, you know, withstand that, that cyber bullying. Absolutely. And incidentally, I had 
already developed enough relationships that I was able to tap into resources very quickly. Uh, we were part of the group that chartered the No Place for Hate program in her school, the first middle school in Conroe ISD. And it was because of the Thank situation you. with yeah. Hannah that we had a fundamental role in putting that together. Wow. But that uh, is the value so of allyship. It's good, it's good to know that something then positive came out of came out of that. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, Desmond, um, I, I know that that your museum unfortunately uh, just had some some issues uh, and actually had to close down and just reopened. Uh, it, can you share uh, that experience? Yeah, uh, until recently, I had never been directly, I think, affected by uh, hate or racism or anything of that sort. But it, it kind of made me realize in hindsight that I literally deal with it every day. Uh, but more specifically for the museum uh, on July 28th, uh, which is actually National Buffalo Soldier Day, uh, our building was defaced. Um, so that day had been a celebration that we uh, had been accustomed to uh, for the last two years at least. Uh, we had done uh, military-inspired art, uh, which is uh, a supposed art symposium, an exhibition uh, that I put together two years ago. This year, of course, we're in the pandemic, so we couldn't do uh, the event like we wanted to. Uh, so we had planned to... Uh, well, actually, we did that day. We we released a, a campaign, fundraising campaign, uh, but also uh, released a, a short documentary, if you will, about uh, with some of the soldiers and, and myself, uh, just talking about experiences. Uh, and so I got a call from a colleague uh, on July 28th that morning, uh, preparing for work. Uh, and the message said, you know, if you need help cleaning the building, let me know. Uh, I thought it was spam. I was like, I don't know, I don't think this is coming from uh, Christine. Uh, but uh, she sent photos and then, you know, uh, the email chain that she had got from uh, the Next Door app, which is a neighborhood app that uh, right. neighbors communicate about things going on in the neighborhood. Um, so it, it, it was true. I immediately rushed over to the, to the museum or the uh, west wall is what we call the San Jacinto side of the building. Uh, it, it was indeed true that our building was defaced uh, with uh, somewhat of a swastika on one side and something about the Democratic Party. And uh, there was also a, a tag of a white supremacist group. Um, so it was very emotional for me because I tell a lot of people that the museum is not just a job. I'm not just the CEO. It's like, it's a part of my family. So it's legacy. So there's a different type of passion and connection that I have with the museum. Not to say that I wouldn't have it if, it, if I was just yeah. uh, the Actually, CEO, just, but- You can spend just a, a minute or so letting people understand the museum and its purpose. Yes, yeah, so what we do is exhibit, everybody knows us as the Buffalo Soldier National Museum, right. uh, but we actually exhibit the entire African-American military experience. Uh, so that's why it's a heavy push now for us to use uh, our actual legal name, uh, which is the Center for African-American Military History. So we, we hold the largest uh, collection of African-American memorabilia in the country. Um, and that's something to be proud of. So that's what makes us actually a national uh, museum. That designation means a lot. Uh, we get people from all over the world. We had uh, a couple from Germany who came just to the museum, came to Houston just for the museum. Uh, and they were able to do several other things while they were here, but he came to research the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, so we get uh, a huge crowd from people overseas and we want to that's that's the thing about it is that we we're not just an african-american history institution we're an american institution so because the, everybody's history we share right. at the museum right. because african-americans contributed to uh making sure that we expanded west if it had not been for the buffalo soldiers we would have not accomplished that um so that's one of the things that kind of just 
boggles me that these men were willing to risk their lives uh, for the sake of America, but were harshly treated then, but also we, we're dealing with some of the same issues now. And, and, that, and that's what, what, you know, what's, what's so horrible about this, even like it's graffiti and unfortunately nobody was hurt, but the, the message is not just an a, attack on, you, you know, like today, but, but on this really important history and, and trying to, you, you know, really cut off that history of the contributions of black Americans uh, to, to our country. Uh, that, that this graffiti is trying to do. And so it's so much more than just defacing a, a wall. Absolutely. And, and that's, a, that's really the message that I've, been, that I've been putting around because some people have said, and I've seen, you know, trolls, or I call them trolls, on Facebook and some of social media about... You can call them trolls, uh, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Call, them, call them trolls. Uh, you, know, about, you know, maybe it was just some kids or it was just, you know, it just was something that just happened. It was a, you know, a harmless tag, but that's not what it was. It, right. it was a direct attack. It was a hateful, right. uh, you know, it was hate behind sure. it. It was derogatory, it, you know, call the thing the thing. Right, and so what what was the response and were, were your allies helpful in responding? Yes, so uh, the, I always say that out of, out of everything that, that's bad, out of every bad situation, there is good. Um, and that has been true for us. The, since we launched that campaign on that day, it kind of sparked a, an entire new community of support in terms of people calling and reaching out and saying, how can they support? How can they help? Um, the, next, the very next day, there was, before I even got to the museum, there were people there. There was news stations there, of course, too. Uh, but there was three companies ready to power wash it. When I got there, they had already started. Um, and then people came throughout the day. So I was there all of Wednesday on the 29th, just talking to people, people walking up, coming to show support to how they can volunteer, how they can donate. Um, so, and Houston has always been good with that type of community. That's the Houston that I know. I didn't know, uh, I, I've told people that I don't know the Houston that did that entire building because we've always gotten some great support and, and community uh, support behind that. And this show, that people actually do care. That's terrific, and um, I, I, HC, I thank you for your for your patience. Uh, you're, you know, last, but of course not not least. Uh, Desmond just talked about you know some positive consequences, uh, and with with the pandemic, uh, Asian Americans have really had to confront uh, hate because of coronavirus, um, and all these, you know really awful terms that have been used and blamed that have been, uh, you, know, you know, focused on, you know, Chinese and, and Asians, uh, blaming them for, for this disease and just ridiculous kinds of phrasing that have been used by uh, uh, people and, and even leaders in this country. I guess one of the positives is, is I've gotten to know um, and work with some of our uh, Asian community leaders in Houston including HC. And so I've gotten to know him through a, a committee that we uh, put together uh, with ADL and leaders of the Asian community. Um, and so HC, it's, it's very good to see you and thanks for being here. Uh, can, you, can you talk about uh, some of the issues that, um, that you and the Asian community have had to confront uh, during this pandemic? Sure, I, I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, thanks, first of all, thanks Mark and uh, ADL for the opportunity, uh, and uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, share my my thoughts on the uh, on the uh, state of things. So uh, as many of you may he have heard uh, since the beginning of this year, uh, us in the Asian American community started feeling. Uh, I guess you know I I really identify with Sarah when she said. Uh, people would look at her differently. That that's how we in the Asian community felt uh, beginning of this year when people saw on the news that there was a lockdown in Wuhan, and subsequently the U.S. consulate in Wuhan was closed. Uh, flights to mainland China uh, were banned, and the pandemic at first it was under control overseas. And then gradually it spread it here in the United States and uh, uh, the, the tension, the, you know, let me just say the negative feelings started to increase 
uh, we we seen an uptick, a surge in incidents uh, against Asian Americans. And then we heard politicians using uh, terms like Kung flu or the Chinese virus to describe it. And uh, it, it's really no surprise that uh, there, we, we see a sudden surge of incidents targeting Asian Americans. There's, uh, there are various uh, Asian American organizations that track the number of such incidents. Uh, as my understanding is that as of about last week, there's about 2,500 incidents of hate targeting Asian Americans throughout the country uh, that we know of. There's, we, we expect the, the actual number to be far higher than that. Uh, some of you may have heard that back in March, a, an Asian family in Midland, Texas, was uh, they were shopping in a local Sam's Club and a person thought uh, these Asian people were there to spread coronavirus and pulled a knife and start stab stabbing them to include their two-year-old and six-year-old children. And fortunately that person was subdued by a, uh, a Sam's Club employee and another law enforcement officer there, but the injury to the Asian family, it, uh, as I understand, will be permanent. Um, and, and I guess, you know, interestingly, that Asian family is not even Chinese, they were Burmese. But to, you know, we, we understand to the eyes of certain people that it's, it's you know, when, when you are full of hate, it's difficult to distinguish your, uh, the, the, the target, the origin. And when you are blinded, when, you, when you're full of, uh, I guess, ignorance and certain perspective, uh, you know, Asian Americans become an outlet of such negative emotions, and, and we understand that to be. Uh, unfortunately, this is this is actually nothing new to the uh, Asian community. Um, ever since the uh, uh, the mid to late uh, 18, uh, 1800s, 1900s, the the first uh, first waves of Asian Americans we were associated with uh, smallpox or the bubonic plague as Asian Americans first came to the coast of California to start building railroads. Uh, but the mixture of negative emotions along with a, a variety of uh, misunderstanding, uh, ignorance, stereotype eventually led to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 signed by President Chester Arthur. And, and you know, you, you think, hey, we're in 21st century, uh, people have progressed a lot in the last 150, 160 years, we know more, uh, we are more tolerant and we are more uh, intelligent, we understand not to hate one another, but this year is reminiscent of 1882, unfortunately, for a lot of us within the community. Yeah, and, and that's, I, I think, you know, one of the, the reasons that I think we were, you know, from the, from the ADL perspective and from the community, from the Jewish community perspective is, not only were, were people, you know, rehashing all these conspiracy theories about the Jews as well as in terms of their uh, in, involvement with this, this pandemic, a lot of those came from, you know, the 14th century and the, the Black Plague that straight out of that playbook in, in, the, in the same thing. And so, and, and that's why I think we, we were able to, to have so much common ground uh, and understanding in terms of how to confront uh, this this wave of hate uh, that really was unleashed very very quickly uh, when when this pandemic really started uh, to, to to roll over over the country. Uh, how how have you know the, the Asian community really worked with allies in in order to 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 help alleviate these concerns? Uh, uh, sure. So, so uh, you know, a group of uh, us in the Asian community, we got together. We we figured we need to do something, um, and and we're fortunate fortunate to have great allies. And and to me, uh, first of all, you know, allyship. What 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 is allyship? Um, allies, uh, an ally to to me personally, I think that is premised on a uh, on a on a basic human emotion, empathy. Uh, empathy, to to quote uh, others, empathy is is something that most of us have, and not all of us may may have the, uh, the the courage to speak out, but most of us have it. Empathy is about identifying the the struggle, the the plight of others. Uh, we we may all come from different backgrounds. We we may have different skin color. We may you know speak different languages, practice 
different religions, and but we all have the same capacity for empathy. Uh, to me, it is brotherhood, it is sisterhood, it is solidarity, and uh, and a perfect example of such solidarity. Uh, that we in the Asian American community received came from an organization called ADL. Uh, there's a guy called Mark Tobin earlier this year who came to our aid. Uh, ADL helped us. Uh, ADL went to Fort Bend County, went to Harris County, went to the city of Houston, and was able to uh, obtain proclamations, statements from our elected officials to denounce hate. So, um, you know, to, to use an example, uh, you know, to, to both identify an ally and an advocate, hey, you know, look, look no further than, than where you're looking at right now. Um, to me, I feel, um, you know, allyship or empathy is looking at others who are suffering and say, hey, brother, can I lend your hand? ADL lent us a hand. That is my example. Well, well, thank you. And, and but I, I tell you, this is a, a two-way street, and we have learned so much from from working with with your community. And we look forward to this being a a, a long-term uh, partnership. And so, but, but thank you for your for your kind words. Um, if I don't know if everybody, if all the panelists are uh, on on mute, but if you are, if you could just make sure you're unmuted, because I want to make sure that everybody can sort of chime in as we as we go forward. Because I, I want to ask all about, and Sarah touched on this a little bit, and everybody has, but really, what what do y'all think is the the essence? What makes a a good ally? And if people want to uh, really work on becoming an ally, what are the steps that that people need to take? And I'm just going to let whoever wants to jump in here go ahead. Sure, um, I think. The biggest thing is compassion and empathy. If you can relate to the human experience of another person and not get uh, trapped in all the labels or the, you know, the things that divide. If we can all look at our basic humanity and understand each other's feelings on a basic human level, compassionately and empathetically, we can find it in ourselves to step up and say, hey, what's happening to you is not right. I am with you. I am here to support you. I am going to stand up and tell whoever is harassing you or upsetting you or directing hate at you that that is not acceptable, not on my watch. And it's as simple as that. You know, if you are walking down the street and you see a Chinese kid being verbally attacked by a neighbor and you just keep walking, that's not allyship. But if you stand there and support the kid or the individual for that matter and tell them that that's not your fault and stand up for them and you don't always feel safe to attack, to counteract the attack but you always have an option to express solidarity in some way. Yeah, I think I think Sarah actually, she, she spoke well about it. Uh, AC did as well. Um, but as I was just thinking like allies is more of uh, static, like they said, static and solidarity, but advocacy is walking in action. Um, so it, it, it's really just, uh, kind of a preference of if you want to stand out and speak out against, stand out or speak out and take action against hate, uh, that's where you choose allyship or advocacy. Uh, me, I'm a man about action. So, you know, something like this happened. So I immediately go into how can we talk about this? How can we continue this? How can we make sure that we're doing the best that we can to push the anti-racism movement? Things like the Black Lives Matter movement that we're in now, uh, that's another thing. Like, I, do I want to just stand there and say, hey, I'm a black man and I believe in this and BLM and then put a, you know, a picture up with my fist or something like that? Or do I actually want to go to the marches? Do I want to be a part of the movement? Do I want to make sure that my voice is heard and I'm making some type of change? That's the, that's the difference between being an ally and being an advocate. 
Thank you for um, making that yes. case. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that, Sarah? I said, thank you for making the case <laughs> or what differentiates an ally from an advocate or vice versa. So being proactive means stepping up and being responsible for creating the change rather than wishing the change happen. So it reminds me of the quote that um, I always wish somebody would step up and then I realize I was somebody. When you realize you are somebody, then you can step up to be the advocate. Absolutely. You know, and, and and but but a journey for for somebody who might be just either you know not totally engaged but wanting to be engaged. I mean, it doesn't have to start right with being like totally uh, you know focused on you know being this advocate that that y'all are described. I mean. Uh, I can't, one of you talked about it. Really, it's, it's sometimes it's the little things that, that you're doing, you know, just on your own in your own daily life by, you know, speaking up or, or calling out, right? Absolutely. Not to denounce being an ally, because I know this that's part of the name of the event, but that's definitely what, what, what I'm asking is just do something. Uh, being an ally is very, very important. It's very pivotal to uh, to just making sure that we incite some type of change. Uh, but yeah, I definitely agree, Mark. It's it's the little things that that actually add up uh, and create the big change that we need. And um, Mark, just you know, from I guess a, a larger historical perspective, you know, it's big movements don't start off as big movements, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they typically will start off as a lot of, uh, you know, little pieces that somehow come together. Um, and, and that's kind of, I think, what we're seeing, you know, as of, as of late. Uh, can you can kind of clarify for that from a historical perspective? Yeah, and, and actually, I think to, to, um, to echo what HC said earlier about empathy, I think that that highlights the local, right? That this starts um, at a local individual level, this, this um, embrace of empathy. I, I, I think that's the starting point. I mean, I think, the, I think another important part of this, um, at least that the history teaches us, is the ways in which we need to see struggles as connected, which is part empathy, but also something bigger. And, and one of the reasons why they're connected or, or actually there have been examples that have been that people have given. So, so Mark mentioned how in the medieval era, Jews were blamed for the bubonic plague and see as, seen as diseased, which then HC mentioned how this stereotype um, associated with otherness was recycled in the 19th century with Asians and Asian Americans. Um, who migrated and settled in the United States. And then at the turn of the 20th century, this association of disease with, with, um, with immigrants and otherness was recycled once again and used to describe Mexicans. And so the reason why these, these struggles are connected is because the ways in which, um, I guess, those in power have defined groups by race has been connected. And so I, I think it's important to, of course, of course, be empathic. Um, but I also think it's important to see the ways in which we're connected in this society. And, and that's key because, because what this is about is, dry, is driving wedges between groups. Um, but the reality is that there are connections that transcend those divisions. And history is uh, that. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned wedges between groups. Uh, and, and I think that there are, there are significant efforts underway to, to do that. Uh, and sometimes there are just disagreements. So I, I'd like to hear y'all's thoughts about what, what do you recommend? How do y'all resolve when there are differences between allies, um, whether it's on pursuit of the same objective or, or maybe that there are different objectives between allies? Um, what do y'all recommend? How do you mediate those differences? 
I'm going off script here, I know, so I'll give you a minute to, That's okay. to answer. Well, when we come together in, on a platform, I mean, I look at the interfaith ministries of Greater Houston and the Houston Coalition Against Hate as being larger platforms that bring allies together under one umbrella to stand up to and fight the hate or the negative sentiments and biases against different communities. We create those opportunities for allies to build the relationships to stand together. When they are jointly working on that mission and have their voice represented in the working of those umbrella organizations, I think it creates an environment where we can develop deeper relationships and develop better responsiveness through allies. And in that context, I do want to uh, share a personal example of when the North Shore Mosque in East Harris County was attacked uh, in an arson attack about three years ago. And we found out about that incident and within a couple of hours of that report coming out, got an email from Interfaith Ministries that there was going to be a city, there was going to be a conference and the city police and the community representatives from all different faiths, as well as many organizations around town were going to have a presence and representation in raising their voice against this incident of hate. So when you can create an environment where the allies can come together quickly and respond to a situation, we are preparing a very connected community in the process. And that's how, uh, you know, it, incidentally, it's because of that situation that the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom Houston chapter became involved in the Houston Coalition Against Hate. And we have, as an organization, developed much deeper relationships because we meet on a regular basis, because we address those issues and connect with each other on a regular basis to prevent incidents of hate. So education, awareness, connection, and response are all pieces of that puzzle. And, and to further um, uh, buttress uh, Sarah's point, uh, to, I, I guess, you know, in terms of the broader uh, perspective of allyship or, uh, or the foundation of it, uh, to me, it is seeing with the eyes of another, listening with the ears of another, and feeling with the heart of another. Uh, it's the ability and the willingness to, uh, you know, to identify with other people who, who come from a different background, who has a different life experience. And, and I think it takes a little bit of practice. You know, you don't necessarily just identify with uh, someone who's different from you overnight. Uh, but I think fortunately, you know, here, here in the United States, we have the ability, we, you know, we are exposed to an incredibly rich and diverse culture here with many walks of life. Like today, like this particular experience, uh, you know, for, I, I, you know, I would otherwise really have the opportunity to in interact with such a broad perspective, a spectrum of different different viewpoints and different perspectives. So I think that's a that's a good first step towards uh, allyship and towards empathy with one another is a willingness to to take a take a look at other people's lives, other people's concern is to hear, is to read, to participate. And, and there are all small things that we can do, uh, you know, to, to participate, to, uh, to understand more about our, our, the Asian American community, for example, come, come eat in Chinatown. I, I promise you it is very safe. I, I have eaten in Chinatown several times. Uh, interact and, and grab a cup of tea here in Chinatown. And, and it's, it's through small steps, baby steps that we get to know one another we get to understand a different culture. We get to interact with people. We get to uh, gradually and slowly ally with one another by understanding each other. I know, and that's a great point. And, and what are y'all's recommendations in terms of kind of specific things or that, that people can do in, in order to gain that insight and understanding? Uh, Desmond, what do you think? What, do you, what would you recommend? Besides, of course, going, going to the museum. 
that that goes without saying. <laughs> so you know that's where I was going to start, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I just, yeah, that's the first step. Oh, right? Absolutely. So I, I think uh, it's definitely about, like Sarah said, it's about education. Um, like AC say, it's about, uh, it's about connection. It's about wanting to know more. Uh, first, you got to start with even what even caring or wanting to know more about a different culture or a different ethnicity or a different background. But then you have to take steps forward, uh, whether it be coming to the museum, if you want to learn about Blacks or African American uh, experiences, coming to the museum or going to HVAC or uh, Googling or going to a library, that type of thing is, is, is engaging with that. With, with what you want to know about or what you want to learn about or what you're uh, thinking about being an ally for or whatever, you know, whatever that case may be is taking part in that, but being proactive in it. Uh, and just like he said, go to, if you want to learn about the Chinese culture, go to Chinatown. Or if you want to know about more about what African-Americans eat, to try soul food or crawfish or something like that. If you, we talked about crawfish a lot in, in our uh, our pre meeting. So it's it's just wanting to be a part of something, uh, but engaging and being proactive in it. By, by the way, Desmond is your man. If you want to try crawfish, he he has, he was lecturing us about the different <laughs> types of crawfish to be had. And and I I have been to the Buffalo Soldiers Museum. Ten out of ten recommend. And, and ultimately, folks, stay curious not just within your community, stay curious of other communities. Absolutely, if I may. Um, yeah. Oh, please. So the, I will go back to the premise that the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom is founded on, and that is it is hard to hate someone you know. It is impossible to hate them if you love them or care about them. So when we have proactively built relationships with the others, gotten to know them and broken down those barriers and biases. We we're able to see each other in a more personal and human capacity. It's very hard to hate somebody you love. It is much easier to hate somebody you don't know anything about and you can otherize and dehumanize them. Exactly. So when you humanize that interaction, when the new kid comes to school and you go and say hi to them and know their name, you can't just yell a slur at them until, uh, you know, it is much easier to yell the slur when you don't know the person. And particularly when it's online, like right. it. There is an anonymity that online interactions afford you. So you think that you're just throwing words into ether. You're not making eye contact with the person that you're attacking. And it is very easy to target them because you are hiding behind that veil of anonymity and can look away much easier and dehumanize somebody. Uh, Mark, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask you a really simple question, which I'm sure you can answer in the few minutes we have left, which is where are we historically? In, can you give us a, a, a framework? Do you think, uh, are, are we, is this more reminiscent of the late sixties? Is it more reminiscent of, of some other time period? Um, in terms of, of the, the movement for racial uh, equality uh, and the, these other um, mechanisms that are permeating our society at present? I know that's a huge question. So just summarize it you know, in a couple minutes if you don't mind. Um, that is a great question, but of course it's a big one. I, 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 do, I do see similarities between the 60s and now in that we have um, you know, very vocal movements of um, that that are that are highlighting various forms of oppression and 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 exhibiting you know widespread solidarity. I I think what's hard to say is what what is going to happen next. Um, you know, what is this going to translate into? Is this going to be short lived? Or is this going to translate into change? And that's impossible. That's impossible to say. Historians are the worst predictors, so I, I, I can't say what's going to happen in the future. All right, ne next, next. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, by the way, I, I want to clarify. I meant the 1960s, not the 1860s, uh, for uh, for the time frame that I was referring to. Just to to be clear, because sometimes it becomes a little worrisome. 
terms of although but what i will say and this is actually the second part that i was going to say is that sadly we are seeing we are also seeing the um i guess the re not resurrection because they've always been here but the empowerment of hateful ideas you know brought into the mainstream and you can of course use the 19th century as an example you can use the early 20th century. This doesn't sadly have to be US focused even. Um, so so the, the, the activists, the activists, uh, the activity, the social activism we're seeing is a response to um, this other process of hate making its way into the mainstream globally. And so this isn't just a story of the 1960s or even the 20th century, but um, the, yeah, the recycling of, an empowerment of old ideas. Sorry to put the dark spin on it, but but that is, I mean, that is how I feel history is teaching us about what we're seeing. Well, and and I understand that, but I but I think really what we've covered today is is far more positive, uh, and, and that is uh, the allyship that we've all become familiar with, even though uh, we have confronted bias and hate uh, in, in all forms uh, that we know that we have been here for each other and will be here for each other in the future. And uh, that we can motivate other people uh, to walk these same paths. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, to, to be a little bit cliche-ish, as long as we have each other, um, that we'll be able to, to weather these storms. And so I want to thank you all for, for being here and for sharing y'all's insight, for y'all's stories, and for people for helping people understand um, how to be allies, uh, how to be advocates, uh, and how to, to, to be in a, in a more effective and, and better way. And uh, from an ADL perspective, we look forward to working with, with y'all and with y'all's communities uh, on many endeavors uh, going forward. Uh, so please thank y'all all. Uh, so much. Uh, this uh, session really is to help us and everyone else uh, build bridges and become allies. Uh, there's so much uh, more work that we need to do uh, to achieve a just and inclusive uh, community for us all. And so we hope this conversation uh, has served as a reminder uh, that we all have the power and responsibility uh, to create a more respectful, equitable, and a just future. We couldn't have done uh, today's webinar without the help of our so many partners. Uh, you've seen the, the logos that were put forward at the beginning, and we'll be sending out uh, those reminders of who helped us uh, partner with this. Thank you to all our partners uh, for being a part of this uh, important webinar. And uh, once again, thank you all to our excellent panelists. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we hope that we'll go forward uh, with renewed dedication uh, to fight prejudice, hate, and bigotry uh, with the passing of uh, Justice uh, Ginsburg. Um, I know that we will all uh, have additional motivation uh, and knowing uh, that we can do that uh, in her memory, uh, that we can uh, fight prejudice, bigotry, and promote love, friendship, and respect. Uh, so thank you all uh, for joining us. And uh, we will uh, we'll be in touch on how we can all become better allies and advocates. Uh, please stay safe, stay dry, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we still on? Folks, are we are we done for today? I'm still here as well. Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, okay. Hey, Desmond, I uh, I haven't been back to to the museum.